Hi. Uh, thanks for joining me here, and I uh, hope your day has been a pretty good day. It's, uh, you know, uh, in these times, a pretty good day is, is actually maybe the equivalent of a great day in other times. Uh, what a journey we've been on uh, going through these 12 steps through the grieving process, and uh, it's brought up times in my life where I've had to truly go into the grieving process and and you know it's such a gift when you do but I've said this many times uh, you know I'm a teaching pastor at Northview Church in Carmel Indiana northviewchurch.us uh, is how you can find out about that but so many times I've said to them I believe that I'm preaching to people who have an epidemic and in the epidemic that I see it's a it's the the epidemic of ungrieved losses that people have because we just tend to just move on or superficially deal with the pain and the suffering. And, uh, you know, Jeremiah 6.14 is just one of my favorite verses of all times where it talks about treating the deep mortal wounds with superficial treatments. And Paul, I'll tell you, we haven't been superficial here as we've worked through these steps. So we come to the end of this journey, but it's really always the beginning of the journey. The last three steps are not the end of anything. They're just continuing to live into this new way of life, a transformed way of life, of recovery, restoration, and uh, really restoring the things that we have lost. And so um, in the 11th step, I, I read my version of the 11th step. Here's my uh, version of the 12th. And once again, I think you'll appreciate how well written the original 12th step was or is in mine it says that we uh, we awakened to all things spiritual and continuing to experience the blessing of transformation in an ongoing attitude and a um and in an act of thankfulness i commit to share this this great god and this great and marvelous process with fellow strugglers as I continue to practice these powerful priorities in all that I do in public and especially when uh, it's just God and me and nobody's looking. Now to me that that's just my little version of the 12 step and so I'll, I'll read it the way it was written. It says this, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry the message to others and to practice these principles in all our affairs. You know, it's such a simple step. I don't know. Maybe we would expect more for the grand finale uh, in the 12th step program and process but um, there it is and so when I have what's called here a spiritual awakening we have to say well what is that just exactly well a person who is spiritually awake versus where I have been several times in my life dead spiritually or um, just you could say unspiritual Another way to say it. But in a, in a, if you've had a spiritual awakening, you have this ability to do things that you couldn't do before. You feel things that you've never felt before, and you believe what you, you could not uh, even think about believing. And you believe that you can do things and... and um, and it just was never that way before. It's such a difference, such a contrast. In fact, before we enter into a recovery process, somebody might say to us, here was how great things were in your life, but now look at what they become. And they're sad for us because what they become is very unspiritual. Now we can contrast, look where they were and look how we have grown beyond that desperate place. So I have a new awareness, a new consciousness of things beyond just what I see or smell or touch, 
uh, so far beyond the physical things that I own. I'm much more interested uh, in other things. And I have, um, I have such relief when I have a spiritual awakening. You know, before the spiritual awakening, I might be coming to grips with, oh, I, I'm going to jail or, or I, oh, I may lose my house or uh, my marriage or whatever. And I'm looking at all these things here on earth, but the spiritual awakening, all of a sudden, the weight of all of those consequences, some I've created and some I did not, but all of that weight just goes away because I'm focused on something different. I'm, I'm looking at things from a different perspective. I see things and feel things from such a different way of life. All that matters is God and eternity with God. What, a, what an amazing way to live. And sadly, we have to get to this point of desperation before we experience that. And then a lot of times we kind of just drift and we get away from it and we need daily to come back to it. And that's why these steps are so important. And why it's so important that we look at the last three steps every day and live in to these three steps so that we don't ever drift too far away. So the spiritual awakening it really is such a, such a gift. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. You know, it's almost like you, you have to, to make your list of people you've hurt. And you have to go ask for forgiveness and make it right. And then once you've done that, even out of fear or whatever, but once you do it, you're so surprised at how God comes into your life in a different way because he told you, if you want things to be right with me, go make them right with somebody else that you've hurt. And then you have this connection with God and you don't want anything here on earth to get in the way of that connection. So you have this spiritual awakening and the harder you work, the more honest you are in working the steps, well, the, the more tolerance that you're going to have for other people and the more unselfish you're going to be and the more peace of mind that you're going to experience and, well, there's just going to be more love that's there. So then um, this spiritual awakening, that's really kind of the first fo focus of the step, goes into the second, which is, we tried to carry this message to other people. Now, let me give you this verse here, Galatians 6, 1. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. I, I know so many... Um, stories having written this book toxic faith people telling me these horrible stories of just cruelty and unkindness and meanness in the way they were treated by a church maybe they did mess up or maybe somebody else messed up but it's um it's so sad to hear about this because if somebody is in trouble humbly and gently helping them is very very different then unleashing all the anger we may have uh, on ourselves for falling short, uh, just letting that spew out onto another person. So I want to I wanna carry my message to other people. And when I see that they're struggling, I want to be gentle and I want to be humble. And humility, uh, I, my approach when I'm humble is, hey, I've been where you are. Or, um, man... I used to struggle, and I don't have all the answers, but I know this. I started to work a program, and it changed my life. And I'd like to introduce you to that program. If you ever want to go to a meeting with me, just let me know, and I'll, I'll take you. 
Um, this part about uh, carrying the message to others, uh, my wife is a big uh, part of that. And here's how she does it. She facilitates groups. Uh, her groups are for women, and one is for all sorts of recovery things, and other uh, groups are for um, sexual integrity, women who have sexual integrity problems. And every one of them has to go through a grieving process to get better, to give up this thing that was so exciting or got them off the path. But we, we can carry the message to others by simply saying to a pastor, uh, I've been using this Life Recovery Bible. It's helped me grieve uh, this workbook to get through this. And I'd like to start a little group for other people that have lost things. What a great gift that is, carrying the message to other people. And then we get to this third part, and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Uh, Dave Stoop and I talk all the time about our relationship and how it has stood the test of time. Now, I got to tell you, uh, that is more him than me because he has so much he's had to tolerate in me. Dave's one of the greatest people uh, I've ever known. One of the most consistent and, um, and character-filled Christians I've ever known. I can tell you a lot of famous people that I know, famous writers, authors, people look up to them. And I can tell you in person, they are not that person. Dave Stoop is that person behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, wherever. And he and I are still writing together and we probably will till one of us dies. And we talk about the, that perhaps the reason we're still together when all these other writing teams split apart and can't work together. And they try to make it look good and nice, but they don't like each other. Um, maybe it's because we knew these steps and the principles, and we have tried to practice these things in dealing with each other. And so we've had tolerance and grace and mercy for each other. And we've made accommodations and we've adapted and, um, it really has been a, an amazing time, but practicing all of these things in all of our affairs, it brings me to this word integration. We integrate this into our lives so that we're not just doing it on um, Sunday or the day we have a meeting we go to, but it's all throughout the week. I know a lot of people, they talk about, oh, I go to all these meetings, I work the program, I help all these people. Well, really, then why are you so angry and critical and controlling? Well, where's that? When does that happen? And it's so interesting. We can, let's say codependency. You could see codependency as where I'm too dependent on another person and I need to separate from them. But miss that another part of codependency is the not co in that way, but control dependency. I depend on control. I try to control everything, everyone, everybody. So I'm over here going, yeah, I don't need, look at that. I used to be this wimpy, weak, uh, just whatever you wanted to do to me, you could just treat me anyway. I was so weak. Now I'm strong, but you never go over here and do the work over here and practice these principles in the affair of control. And if you don't do that, if you're, if you're still controlling, then you truly have not fully ever surrendered everything to God. And that's what we want to do. So when we get off track in this uh, 12th step program, we get back into my power, not God's, me trying harder again. If you see that, boy, you just got to get back into a great group and or get a different sponsor or get into some counseling. When you start to um, participate in moderate indulgences, it'd be like a drinker saying, I can socially drink a little bit, a little beer here and there won't hurt. But for somebody who's been grieving, a moderate indulgence is, well, you know, that's, it's okay if I'm just a little bitter or a little resentful or, you know, don't let yourself do that. Or if I get into this mindset, well, I've repented. That's all I need to do. I'm done with the program. I've done it all. Um, or maybe um, I have a new way to justify 
being angry about what I lost or angry at the person I lost. Maybe it's my pride that gets in the way. Maybe it's just I'm starting to isolate again. I know this. Loss can be really, really complicated. One of my friends um, died. And um, we were in a lot of groups together, did a lot of things together. He was actually a government official. And um, everybody kind of looked up to him. He was, he was really an incredible guy. And then after he died, uh, his wife, who was our friend also, uh, started getting the phone calls. He owed this much money here, this much money here. I mean, the debts were incredible. He was borrowing money that he knew he could not repay, that he would dump onto his wife when he died so that he could look so good and so powerful and you know, his legacy is now so weak. It's really sad. His wife, grieving the loss of this bigger-than-life guy, then goes into grieving that she really never knew him. She did, uh, but not fully. I don't know what you've lost. I don't know how complicated it is, but I, I know that just when you think you've got a handle on it, um, new things happen and they're painful but God is there for you and he can comfort you through the Holy Spirit that he promised us 1 Peter 4 1 through 5 is one of uh, my favorite passages I want to read it to you so then since Christ suffered physical pain you must arm yourselves with the same attitude that he had and be ready to suffer for if you have suffered physically for Christ you have finished with sin you won't spend your rest of your life chasing your own desires but you'll be anxious to do the will of God you've had enough of in the past of the evil things that godless people enjoy their immorality and their lust their feasting and drunkenness and the wild parties and all of their terrible worship of idols of course your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things that they do so they slander you but remember that they will have to face god who stands ready to judge everyone both the living and the dead i was doing a bible study through uh, going through the Bible, studying things, you know, a little deeper than normal. And I remember coming to this passage about having this um, attitude of Christ willing to suffer. And I thought, yes, I've got that attitude. And then it said, um, but until you've experienced pain, you're not really finished with sin. Wow. Grieving's painful. And when we go through it, it's a finishing up of not just sin, but it's just a finishing of the depths of despair and pain. And it is a way, a way of 12 steps of gradually going from my pain and obsession, isolation and desperation to moving into the presence of God on a daily basis. That's what I want for you now. If you need some help getting there beyond anything we've done here, you call us 1-800-NEW-LIFE.